I'm back, Paul. I survived. Hey, awesome. Excellent news. I, we saw your comments coming in in the in the show, so I was like, okay, well, he's he's clearly posting from somewhere. Uh, yeah, from beyond the grave. I'm actually, I actually didn't make it. <laughs> from beyond the grave. <laughs> this is the first supernatural pod. So this is going to become, you know, a paranormal podcast that you host with your ghost co-host. I don't think that you're dead. I refuse to believe it. You're harsh. You refuse to believe in me. All right. Well, I I suppose I must disclose I am not a ghost. But rather than talk about that, why don't you tell me what you've been up to while I was convalescing? Yeah. Well, so um, a, a few weeks back, I went on Fiverr to get some art done, um, some concept art. And then while I was there, I was like, Fiverr oh, man, so I could. cool. It seems pretty neat. I don't know if they're, I don't know. We'll see how what you think of it after my story is done. Okay. <laughs> so, I mean, I only I used it I only used it once and I got the cover of my book and I mean normally, you know, book covers are hundreds of dollars and I didn't have to pay that much and I was really happy with the cover I got, so I was like, "Wow, this is great." Yeah, yeah. It's if you know what you want and there's like a it's a specific thing that a lot of people want, then you can just go on there and be like, "Hey, here's the thing." do the thing for me and they're like awesome i did the thing for you and like yay and they're like yay and everyone's happy all right well let me hear your story so i was i was on there and i i ordered some stuff and and got it done and it was like okay this is neat uh and then i was like wait i i make a bunch of things like i could put a bunch of my services on here and and maybe get some some jobs through this so i uh you know submitted for the thing and put my 1092 or whatever it is you got a tax form filing and and then there it said, okay, it's approved. And so then I started making gigs. And so you you have to like do this whole form, fill out this whole form for a gig. It's like, okay. And they say, oh, don't worry. You can make as many gigs as you want. Like it's, you know, it's easy, but they don't make, you can't like copy a gig, and, like take all the settings and just like duplicate it to like oh. make another gig and, you know, like change the, the zone that it's in or whatever. It's, it's assuming that you're just doing one thing. And then like, oh, you want you want to do something else? Okay, I guess. Here you go. You're starting back at square one. What's your name? Or what it's not that bad, but you know, what what's the area that you want to work in? But if you wanted to offer like, I will make you a model in Blender versus I will make you an animated 3D character in Blender, those are two very different things that need to be priced differently. But they're gonna have a lot of overlap. Right, exactly, exactly. So I started doing that, where it's like, okay, well, here's the 3D modeling, and then here's like, chain altering your 3D model so it can be 3D printed, because you know, those are like super different. One's like create an oh, original yeah. thing, the other's like, here's this you know model that I ripped out of a game or something, and I want to make a mo 3D print of it. It's like, okay, well, I can do that for you, but like, if you're looking for those things, it'll be different. So I started making these. I think I ended up making like six or seven, and. uh you know, it took me probably the better part of a couple days, you know, just like clicking through the boxes and finding screenshots and importing them, getting the right resolution because they don't want it. They don't want it. There's no tools for cropping stuff. They're just like import it at this resolution or we're just going to scale it all right. down. Like, okay, fine, whatever. And so it's it's not super friendly, I guess is what I'm saying. Like the uh, also, I found that like the interface is not very friendly for either side. When I was ordering things like there wasn't an easy way to be like my open orders. You have to go into like messages and then like find like message history to find the orders that you've been working on and then so it's it's weird it's weird that like there's no way to just find the stuff that you've already ordered and are communicating on um and then same thing on let on the selling side like when i go to selling there's no way to find out like you know what's my can I change all my pricing all in one place? No, you have to go in like each gig and then like, oh, and so it's got like six steps for, for creating a gig. You know, it's like the name of the gig and the categories and then you go to the next step and you do the things. And if you want to go back and change something, you have to go back through each step. So you go back to the step you want to change and you update that. And then it's like, okay, here's the next step. It's like, okay, yeah, I already did this step. Next. And it's like, okay, here's the next step. It's, so it's 1995 and you're running a, a Windows install wizard yeah <laughs> right exactly uh so it's not great uh, the experience was not was not really what i was hoping for on that end either so it's like fiverr okay it, like if you're if you're just doing this once it would be fine right because like you just do it once and great 
But if you want to change anything, if you want to duplicate anything, if you want to like redo anything, if you want to come back and, you know, like start again later, whatever, it's, it's a hassle. So I get them all done. I get them all finished. I'm like, oh God, finished. Finally, you know, thank you. I'm glad this is done. I can go on to do other things. Um, so the next day I'm like, okay, I'm going to check my gigs, you know, see how you know, there's like three or four clicks on this one. And there's like, oh, 20 impressions and like five clicks on this one. It's like, that's cool. You know, there's something's happening. I don't know if those numbers are good or not. It's probably not good, but you know, it's better than, than no one paying any attention. So I was like, neat. And uh, so then later that day, I got an email from Fiverr saying, we've suspended your account. You've been reported for, <laughs> you've been reported for copyright infringement. And, uh, and we're we're going to manually review your account, but in the meantime, you can't. What is it? You can't create any new gigs. Uh, we've taken all of your gigs down, and you can't order any new material. So, like, you can't even use our service to buy stuff. So, like, you're completely suspended, and we're going to review your account manually. Um, but we're, you know, don't try any funny business. Or what, I, I don't know. I don't know what they're, they're just like, you know, wow. we're letting you know that we've completely locked your account down. And um, so I was like, oh, okay. Um, I guess you'll get back to me soon with this. Uh, spoilers, two weeks later, still have not ha heard anything from them. So the manual review process is either taking a long time or it's just a facade for them remotely and robotically taking stuff down. I don't know. Um, so that's still not come back online. Uh, so I'm like, I'm looking at my gigs. And I'm like, oh, well, I, you know, maybe I could like make a new account that, you know, like, wait, I, what was the copyright I, infringement? Did, did you just uh, like, okay. So, so like for, first off, I don't believe in copyright at all. I, well, I, I mean, I believe it exists, but I, I think it's a really bad idea and terrible. And so like, I don't involve myself with knowing what any of the regulations are. So I don't know if I unintentionally put something up there it, it was probably i suspect it was probably when i put up the um the thing for modifying models i put some images up of like examples of some characters and one of them was like a character from uh, uh rwby and someone had asked me to make a character and so like i tried to make it look exactly like the one from rwby and i guess i succeeded because even though i made this character myself it looks just like the one from the show and so maybe that was what it was and they're like that guy just took a screenshot I, I don't i don't know what's going on um at i don't they didn't give any details so like first off i don't believe in it so it's like nonsense that they're enforcing it anyway secondly i put up a bunch of stuff where i modified things so like if someone else's model is up there and they're like oh well you know that's my model it's like well i'm not saying it's my model i'm saying that i changed it like look at what i changed right. about it um so, and so, and so I don't know what it was that they, they took down. So I was like, okay, well, but maybe I can just like, you know, copy all the information that I put in here out and like, you know, make a new account and then just like put them up one by one maybe and see which ones get struck or whatever. But when they lock down your account, you can't, you can no longer go in and view or edit your, your uh, gigs. So all that information is just like, has disappeared. They've all been declined or whatever. And, and I can't get into them. Wow. That is ridiculous. Yeah. So like, then comes even the good part. If, so like a uh, few days oh. later, I get an email from Fiverr and they're like, hey, don't forget, you can boost your gigs with, you know, these special <laughs> tools. And I'm like, if you guys re reinstated my account, no, it's still locked down. Okay. So you're, what, is this a taunt? What's going on here? So I delete the thing. And then, you know, like three days later, okay, and, and on your next step to re reaching your critical success for your Fiverr thing, you know, here's, here's some tips for your store. I'm like, oh, this is, the, they're putting me on their mailing list. Okay, great. So I delete this one, you know, like maybe they'll stop. Nope. And like two days later, oh, here's some more tips. So I go in there. I'm like, okay, where are my email settings to turn off? Like, you know, tips for sellers, uh, spoilers. No settings. There's no way to convince them to stop sending me advertisements for a service that they have intentionally locked me out of and implied that I'm using illegally. So that's great. That is ridiculous. A perfect storm of like overreach, apathy, and incompetence. Uh, the, I mean, this is, I mean, this has been going on with YouTube for over a decade. Oh, your account's been suspected, suspended. And for years, it was like, for what? 
For what? Well, copyright infringement. Yeah, but where? <laughs> In your video. Where? There's nothing. It's all made by me. It's like, well, you hummed the first three notes of Eleanor Rigby, you thieving bastard. Or whatever it was. Or right. most likely it was, you were reported by somebody. And right. Like, you were just, who, who is this person? Do I have a right to face my accuser? Well, no, this isn't a court of law. No? The, yeah, the, it's just such a ridiculously broken system. And it's just hilarious that Fiverr is just like... Uh, I, I think this makes the case that Fiverr really does favor people on the buying side and kind of doesn't give a shit about artists. That's how I read this. Fiverr was very accommodating to me as somebody putting money into the platform. Mm, yeah. Very Although interesting. Without, without artists, uh, there is no Fiverr, so I I'm not sure right. how their business model is going to sustain itself with that mindset. Well, but who knows? Well, it's the it's like we talked about a few weeks ago when you have a high, when you've got a glut of people willing to contribute, then yeah, you're true. free to you're free to exploit them. <laughs> you're free to mistreat them because hey, there's just a whole line of rubes going around the corner, so we can treat you like crap. Yeah, yeah. The the people that I was uh, interacting with, one of them was from Myanmar, which I imagine their uh, living wage is probably much lower than is here, so. Yeah. Yeah, the uh, person that did the cover for Mass Effect, I strongly suspect did not speak English and was dealing with me through automatic translation. Mm, yeah. There was just there was just weird stiltedness that you wouldn't... There was weird <laughs> repeating phrases that I don't think think would make sense um for somebody that just like knew a little bit of english right yeah yeah it's, it's technically correct but not natural right and if you learned a little bit of english like in school or whatever then you know sh constructing a sentence like this is probably the first thing you learn so like why would you mess up at this level yeah. You, yeah. Can, you can communicate this complicated thing about Photoshop layers, but you have trouble greeting me, you know? Right. Yeah, I got one message from someone where the um, the boilerplate had not been completely filled in and had, like, you know, like, client's name or whatever is still in there <laughs> instead of my name. I was like, I see what you're right. doing here. I I'm not offended because, like, I understand why you're doing it, um, but maybe up your A-game, you know? <laughs> Right, right. And the, this is not a dig on, on the guy who did the cover for Mass Effect. I think he did a great job. We managed to, we managed to muddle through it. Um, you know, we even did a few revisions and I was able to communicate with them. So he put in the work and I'm, I'm very happy. But it is, it is funny that we collaborated basically through Google Translated. Yeah. It's a, that's a funny interaction. So while you were, um, being griefed by Fri Fiverr, I was being ah, I was being griefed by my own inability to make English words. I'm making fun of this guy, but I can't even speak English <laughs> either. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's my excuse? Yeah. So, last week I went in for surgery, and then I vanished. I vanished for a while. I vanished for a whole week. It wasn't last week, was it? It was over a week ago geez i've kind of lost track of time so here's how it goes hey doctor i've got a problem here's my problem oh no problem this is super easy to solve it's an outpatient procedure you're in you're out zero recovery time absolutely no problem sweet um, you know sign me up you know connect me with the specialist i'm going to do that and by the way some people might be able to figure out what this procedure is i mean it's personal i'm not going to talk about the mechanics of it or whatever and i don't mind if you figure it out but i don't want people guessing in the comments because that'll just make me feel weird so just let it go and if you figure it out that's your business so anyway the doctor's like no recovery and this is true I know somebody had this procedure and they, you know, were up and around that same day. They just like, they, they didn't have to be put under or anything. 
They just went in. Bounced right back. Right. It was like having your teeth cleaned. It was just nothing. Right? No discomfort. Hardly any time at all. Nice. I go to the specialist and he's like, okay, well, in your case, your problem's a little more severe. We're going to have to use um, the, a more invasive procedure. Oh, uh, uh, okay. Well, all right. I, I still want my problem fixed. Sign me up. All right. So I get to the hospital and they're talking about putting me under through general anesthetic. And I'm like, holy cow. Putting me all the way under, not just like the, like when they do something that'll make you uncomfortable. Sometimes they, they give you a little nap. They give you some morphine derivative. They'd like right, just make you right. sleepy. And you just sort of like, you just sort of drift off through it and you don't remember it. But this is hard general anesthetic, you know, where they could just cut your leg off during procedure. You won't know it. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. I And I woke up. And I did have all my legs, so that was good. <laughs> and you but could see the nurse wheeling the razor ravager out the out the door. <laughs> right. <laughs> and he's like, "All right, I'm going to give you a recipe. I'm going to give you a not recipe. Why is my brain going to the wrong word? Prescription. Boy, that's scary. <laughs> you reach for the word, and your brain just grabs the wrong word." Oh, that felt weird. So you know, it's a small slip of paper that you use to, you know, get a thing that you put in your body. So it's, it's a recipe, basically. <laughs> He's like, I'm going to write you a prescription for Percocet. And I'm like, whoa, what's going on here? What Percocet? I, I don't take any of those, that class of medicine, that whole, everything adjacent to Percocet. I don't take it. They make me feel awful. I, they are nightmare drugs for me. I know this is like coveted mm. by people and they get addicted to them or whatever. I, I don't know what people get out of them. But for me, those drugs are horrible. Um, they are worse than the pain they're supposed to be masking. And they don't even do a good job at masking the pain. I don't know. Why no, not for you anyway. Me. Right. Right. For me, it doesn't. And I'm like, I can't take that. And he's like, well, okay. But all right. Well, this is going to be, this is going to hurt. You're, you're going to be very uncomfortable. Um, but hey, you're not going to have any complications. <laughs> we don't have any other painkillers. There's nothing <laughs> that it, we can give you other than this drug that'll make you want to die. Right. I, I mean, he told me just, you know, go get over the counter like Advil or whatever. But, you know, mm. th that might not be enough for this. <laughs> he kind of warned, you know, you, we usually give people something stronger for this. And... But, you know, hey, no complications, and you should be on your feet again in, like, three or four days. Well, I next day, I had complications. I was back in the emergency room, and I'm like, oh. Oh, no. This is, yeah, and so then I had several days of dealing with that. And this three or four days, I don't know where that number came from, but it's been, it's been a week and a half, and I think I'm just now getting back to normal. Like, that was a good solid week of, like, real serious... This was the most painful procedure I've ever had. And I had my gall... They, they took out one of my organs before. <laughs> and it did not <laughs> hurt as bad as this procedure. So I signed up for... You'll be in and out. It's like having your teeth cleaned. And what I got was a week of horrors and misery. And, I mean, I actually lost quite a bit of weight. Like, I didn't eat for several days. I, I couldn't get out of bed. It was really rough. So, yeah, if you guys guess that he had his skeleton replaced with adamantium, like the Wolverine, uh, just don't say anything. It's, it's personal. No, I got the, um, what I got was, I don't mind telling you, I got a robot arm and a laser eye. They call it the Locutus package. Aw, um, lucky. They were, right. They were having a sale, and I thought, you know what? Give me the Locutus. Um, what I like about <laughs> the laser eye is that when people come up to interact with you socially and you look at them, your laser is blasting them right in the eye and it makes them want to look away and leave. And so it cuts way <laughs> back on social interactions. So this has been a win for me. At least that's what the text messages from my wife hint are the problem. <laughs> and now you can sleep uh, hanging from the roof like a bat with your robot arm. Right. <laughs> yes. Well, the robot arm is longer than my organic arm was by like three inches. So like I can get things that are just a little bit further away. 
scratch uh, that spot please. in your back finally right well you remember patrick stewart when he was the cute he had the cutest thing and the r his his like robot grabber claw was very obviously just over his hand uh -huh. <laughs> it made his arm functionally longer and it was sort of hilarious because you know sometimes you can tell and sometimes you can't and you could just tell his hand was in there <laughs> and like yeah, borger what, and meanwhile the borg queen is like being fully cgi'd and then like right yeah. And they were like, but we better let him keep his real hand. He might want to reverse this procedure later. <laughs> the Borg is so thoughtful. Right. All right. That's all the complaining I'm going to give you. It was just, if I had known up front, I probably still would have do done it. But I really wish I would have known how hard that was going to be before I went to do it. That caught uh, me really yeah. off guard. All right. So tell me what you've been up to in the video games in the video games i have been playing a bunch of old games um valheim had an update hearth and home they updated a bunch of foods and uh you can now breed the locks the big woolly mammoth kind of things and uh there's some new materials and so i just i went and you know kind of played around with valheim for a while um and then someone in the comments on the last diecast i think mentioned filament as a game where uh at the end like the boss stage or whatever it's not really a boss battle it's a puzzle game but at the end it's much uh it's much different systems although it's the same mechanics so they like kind of swap out a bunch of stuff and have like all these unique puzzles i was like oh that sounds cool so i've been playing filament which i've i'm very much enjoying it is difficult and uh and i'm having a good time with it and then i picked up project high rise because it's basically Sim Tower, and uh, I have fond oh, memories of playing Sim Tower. I do too, man. Sim Tower. It was one of those games that feel like it was the first. It felt like it was a rough draft for a much better game. I always felt like if if there'd been an, like this, they needed to iterate on this one more time, and then they never did. And fortunately, someone made Project High Rise. It's actually made by the same people who made Filament, which is why I picked it up. I was like, oh, what else do these guys make? Oh, Project High Rise. Oh, yes. Done. Sold. So uh, I've been having a good time with that, too. It's it's kind of um, fiddly, I guess. Like, it doesn't do much for you automatically. It's all, you know, like you have to place each electrical wire manually. You can't just be like, wire this whole floor or or whatever. So it's it's not great in that sense. Like, I built a skyscraper all the way up to the height limit, and you have to, like, place each floor manually. And you can drag and drop each floor, but you can't, like, just, like, drag all the way up to the top of the map. You have to do it each one. So, that was... It's not it's not very user-friendly in that way, but I think they're trying to go for the, like, very fiddly, micromanage uh managerial kind of thing, as opposed to, like, sweeping construction sim. Interesting. Filament, I'm watching uh, some gameplay footage now, uh, looks like looks like your goal is to take a piece of string and wind it through an environment so that it hugs all these pillars. You're supposedly wiring up a spaceship or whatever, but really, this is a game that was probably inspired by some sort of knitting. Yeah, it's kind of, uh, it's kind of interesting. I, I have not seen a puzzle game like it. It feels... It kind of reminiscent of um, of the witness for whatever reason, just with like a lot of these things have grids in them, although not all of them have grids. It's that's the closest thing I can think of is the witness, just because it's like you know finding paths through stuff. But it's right. um yeah, it's it's a very different kind of experience, and I I was kind of impressed that when you get on board the ship, you you know like do the first two or three tutorial puzzles, which are very simple, and then you get on board the ship and you can just go anywhere, you can do whatever puzzle you want, and so it. It was, uh, it was a very open experience, so, uh, yeah, it's pretty neat. It's a pretty neat, uh, it's a pretty neat thing. I'm still working my way through it. Like I said, it's very hard, so, um, it, it may take me a while. <laughs> right. Okay. And Project High Rise. Oh, I gotta check that out. You know, here's, here's how much I was blindsided by this, um, by this surgery. The day before for my surgery um death loop which is the 
game, same, the team that made Prey, which I'm reviewing now on my site, this is their next game. It's called Deathloop. And I bought it, installed it. And I was like, all right, tomorrow, as soon as I get home from, you know, it stalls overnight. And I'm like, I'm going to get home from the hospital and I'm going to play this video game. And I did not sit in my computer chair for the next six, six days. Oh, yikes. Yeah, in fact, actually, I tried like on day four, I... I was like, all right, I do not have the mental ability to play, um, like, a shooter, which is what Deathloop is. But maybe I could play some, you know, Minecraft on peaceful mode. But no, I couldn't even do that. So, <laughs> I've played nothing. But you've played some cool stuff. I'm trying to hold up my end while you're away. Right. I, I should be playing Deathloop, but I don't know. Filament looks so cool. <laughs> Like, I want to play Filament right now while we're talking. You probably could. It's, you know, you won't be able to talk while you're doing it. But... <laughs> right. Well, Maybe I'm we should talking. do these mailbags. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Dear DieCast, I hope you're doing well. Yesterday, I stumbled upon one of Seamus' old articles about how his video card died on him after a y only a year and a half. It was a harrowing tale of anxiety, anger, and confusion. And it got me thinking, what's the worst piece of hardware you've ever had? It could be one that failed extremely quickly or one which was just ag agonizingly obtuse or annoying. Keep being awesome, Lino. All right, do you have one for this, Paul? Yeah, it's nothing spectacular, but I, um, I have a, a nice DSLR camera that I wanted to hook up directly to the computer to use as a webcam. And so I bought a HDMI to USB converter box. And they're not cheap for whatever reason. Um, and so I, I bought one off, uh, I think it was Banggood. And uh, it's still like 80 bucks or something. And so it arrives, I plug it in, it works. It's like, great, fantastic, you know, this all works, cool. I get it all set up, play around with it, figure out how it works. You know, put it back in the drawer. Uh, like three months later, I want to use it. And so I pull it out, plug it in, and it, it works for like one second and then stops updating <laughs> and i can't get it to work more than one second and it's like why i know this works i know it's like there's nothing i haven't dropped it in the toilet or anything like why is this not working now it's just been sitting there it's not been doing anything it's been taking a vacation how could it not be working now and so like and i keep fiddling with it and trying different things and it progressively gets worse and worse until finally it just like stops responding altogether i can't get it to, to hook up to the computer and it's just like okay i guess it's dead i guess i i bought a paperweight oh yeah and it's been a few months so you can't even return it yeah exactly for me the reigning champion of absolute garbage that i've owned is still the hp pavilion computer i had back in the aughts it was a machine of pure misery. It was just a Windows, I think it was Windows XP machine that came preloaded with a lot of crap. One of the drive, I think the DVD drive was dead on arrival. Oh, it couldn't play any video. It couldn't play any movies. It, it, it was too, the DVD drive was too slow to play movies. They would stutter. Oh no. Um... Or maybe it wouldn't read at all in the other draw. I forget how it worked. But it was like everything about the machine was horrible. It was just this torture device to use. It was ghastly. It, it felt like they'd sabotaged it deliberately at the factory. Just preloaded it with so much garbage. Um, and I've never forgiven HP for that. I hear people talk about, oh, it was way better today. I'm like, I don't care. They owe me a computer. If they have better computers, they can mail me one and then we'll talk. And four years of my life. Right, yeah. I was stuck with that for a few years. I really couldn't afford to replace it. So that was pretty horrible. Ugh. It was It was ordered by my company. So technically I didn't pay for it, but I did pay for it. I paid for it with my time. <laughs> Oh, that's the worst. And you got a company computer and it's like, okay, well, I've got to use this for my work because that's what it's for. But it's right. terrible. Oh, it was so bad. It was so bad. Like, just could, like, it, 
it was designed as though it was for idiot. You know, this is like grandma's computer, right? Oh, we want something idiot proof for grandma so that she can get on. This would have been before Facebook, but you know, whatever grandma wants to do on the internet, she can send her emails mm -hmm. or whatever. Or look at her yeah, phone. Yeah, preloaded with AOL so she can get on instant messenger. Right. But it was so broken at everything that it took actually my technical skills to get it to do basic things. Like, who is this machine for? It, it, I had to like, it. oh, it was so bad. I, I forget how it works now. But it was the preloaded launcher that they try and replace the Windows interface with, you know, just this big box of icons uh, for you to use. Oh, no. And they're all just shovelware garbage, and, like, half of it doesn't work. And it's really hard to get to the rest of the interface. So if Grandma actually got this computer and she wanted to use an application... Like, she wanted to use a regular Windows application, she would have been absolutely unable to do so. And it's like jailbreaking so, a smartphone where you're just like, yeah. oh, this is the interface. This is how you interact with the computer now. Right. It did feel like you had to be able to jailbreak it to do basic things. And then the mm. because there was so much garbage, the, this Windows install died often. And then I'd have to reset oh, the factory no. default. And then I'd be stuck with, you know, all the garbage again. Wow. So, I can yeah, see their so thinking, I'd... though. Like, oh, it's for Grandma. Grandma always gets her computer all messed up and it's broken. You can't use it. We'll just start her off with those expectations. And then it, when she breaks it, she won't even notice. <laughs> right. All right. Um, you can take the next email. No, dear Diecast. What do you think of That's the recently already announced... Off. I know, right, yeah. Starting in the black, or in the blue, in the red, I don't know, in the green. Starting in the green. How, how, does, how does accounting work? What do you think of the recently announced KOTOR complete remake? It's being done by a tiny non-Bioware studio, and they're giving it a new gameplay, of course. And the credit writing team is bigger than the original game, so we can expect a massive narrative change as well. KOTOR 1 is old and buggy enough that it could use a remaster, but... If they're keeping neither the gameplay nor the writing of the original, then I wish they'd just throw these resources at making an entirely new game. It feels like the only reason this exists is because brand recognition is a powerful market force, and Bioware was more willing to license out remake rights than new KOTOR game rights. 93. Thank you, 93. That is... that is weird. Um, I watched a trailer just before I came in here, and at the end of the trailer it said, Coming to PS... Whenever the current PlayStation, PlayStation 5. And I'm like, hmm, is that coming only to PlayStation 5? Or are you just, it, is this a Sony-made trailer? And they're like, hey, we're going to have it too. And we're not going to mention anybody oh, else right. having it. So, like, that would be weird to only have it on the PlayStation. But on the other hand, I mean, it was announced at a Sony press conference. So I don't know. Yeah, if it didn't I, say exclusively, then probably it's just a marketing jab. Right, right. They're trying to imply that it's exclusive. They, they doesn't say exclusive, but it says coming to PS5. So, yeah, I'm sure you're right. So, yeah, I agree with 93 here. Like, if you're not keeping the, if you're not keeping the gameplay and you're not keeping the story then that means you're going to re-record all that dialogue, and that means you're going to have to hire all those actors. That means you're making the entire game over again. This is a big freaking game. This is back when RPGs used to be really, really content-heavy. Um, like, the longest season of spoiler warning, by a long margin. When I, you know, back when we did the show, we did dozens of games, and the longest season by far was the original KOTOR. There is so much game there. So, like, what are you doing? It's a small team is going to remake this huge game from the past using modern methods at AAA standards? That's not going to work. And, like, why are you remaking it if you're not retelling the same story? Like, why, why do that? That's not a remake. I wonder if they're going to do it in installments like the Final Fantasy VII quote remake. Oh, unquote. I wonder. Yeah. It is weird. that There's no reason to do that. There's, 
I mean, you can have the pressure suit mini game be its own game. <laughs> its entire game. It's a. It's actually a tie-in phone game. You've got to like <laughs> pause it on your PC and then open up your phone and and play through the underwater section on your phone. Ah. Uh... I think that was like an entire episode of Spoiler Warning, wasn't it? Oh, I believe it. Oh, it's brutal. Like, oh. You know, even when playing through on your own, that was just savage. Even back in the day when we had a lot more tolerance for games wasting our time. Um, yeah. yeah, that was excruciating. The slow walk, the sort of obtuse mechanics and the gotcha moments and the dumb puzzle oh, it was all so awful. Now like, oh, here's the key card game. We have to backtrack to the beginning, get the key card and then backtrack again. It's like, okay, yeah, you, you do that in Doom because you can run at like 80 miles an hour. <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, and, it, and it's weird because you're like, well, normally games do that sort of thing because they want to pad it out. But like, this game is so friggin' long. Why would anybody pad it? Yeah. I'm I'm happy they're making it, but mostly because I've been getting a ton of commissions for making models from the old Kotar game now. Oh, cool. Not through Fiverr, I take it. No, not through Fiverr. They can keep their business, apparently. All right. Dear Diecast, I can appreciate good enemy design and those of bosses in, partic in particular. One technique that is interesting is the degree in which a boss is allowed to cheat the game mechanics. Something simple is making a boss a clone of your character, except it has infinite ammo slash mana. More interesting is a boss that suddenly has immunity against a subset of your weapons. What's your favorite cheaty boss? Which boss went too far? With kind regards, Marvin. And you can read the rest of Marvin's novel in the show notes. Um, I... That was like one eighth of the question. It's true. It's but, huge. Um, so yeah, this is a big topic. Bosses. I mean, bosses kind of by their nature, you expect them to break some of the rules. For mm. me, the most infuriating ones, one was in uh, Control, where you fight a mirror version of yourself. And... Uh, oh. You don't know what the rules are. Like, uh, you don't know what the rules are. You just, there's a suddenly a copy of yourself trying to kill you, except she doesn't obey any of the rules of the game. Like, she can use powers you don't have. She's not a mirror of you. She's just, like, a foe that uses your character model. Oh, weird. Uh, so it's like, yeah, she so, has all the powers that you don't have. So then it's like, you know... <laughs> All these powers you don't have access to in the game, clown powers and stuff. Right. But this is like, I don't know, like, does she have my powers? Does she have super versions of my powers? I mean, I can't do what she's doing. Could I do it with a different build? I don't know. How am I supposed oh, to fight yeah. this character? And it's a mirror match. So I thought, ah, I'm supposed to trick her into killing herself with these homing missiles or something. And no, it's literally, you just sh fucking shoot her. <laughs> like, it's the... <laughs> Like it, More it plays, Daka. Yes, it plays it up like it's this brilliant, like oh, you traveled into the mirror world, and it's gonna be a puzzle boss or something. Like you gotta trick her into killing herself, or you gotta let her hit you, and that'll damage her. And you know, it's like no, it's just you just shooters. It's just a friggin' boss. <laughs> Voldemort and the Horcruxes bring in the army. Right, right. <laughs> it's just so that was super duper lame and beneath it for the game control. Like it was just so stupid of all the clever things you could do with the idea of a mirror match. And the game designer was like, "Well, what if you just shoot them a lot? That's pretty cool. You got a lot of guns in this game. You got almost three. <laughs> Um, Eats a slice of pizza directly from the box. <laughs> right? So, but a uh, cheating boss that actually is not horrible, but I still 
found it incredibly off-putting was the end of Beyond and Good and Evil. It's sort of a quick time event, boss, which is already a huge red flag. That's uh that's a huge red flag. Don't do that. Yeah. But then don't do that one. But then it reverses your controls. What? So like, oh, I need to press up the the prompts say press up and then down. And that means you need to press down and then up. All your controls are like flipped. Um, uh, one of the problems I had, I played Beyond Good and Evil on the PC, and the PC port wouldn't let you do invert mouse, so the controls were always backwards for me for the entire game, and I was just constantly fighting the controls, and it was awful. Um, or maybe it wasn't, maybe it was, maybe I played it on the Xbox 360. I can't remember right now, but anyway, I could not invert the controls and so it was the game was backwards all the time for me and then the final boss is backwards backwards and i was like no no i'm done i i was just so sick of like not being able to do the simple thing not being able to control the camera properly i remember what it was it would let you invert the mouse so that you know pushing forward looks down but it would also, at the same time, invert side to side, so that pushing to the right would turn no. the camera left. No! Yeah. That's what it did. And so, this was a constant point of irritation for me. And then I got to the final boss, and it was a input-reversed quick-time event. And I was just so furious and so done with it. So, I never beat the final <laughs> boss. I've never beaten you Beyond Good up. and Evil. I, I gave up at the final boss. I didn't give up. I I refused to participate. You ex you exercised your moral authority. Right. I I don't have to I don't have to put up with this. Other <laughs> than that, I I don't tend to play a lot of boss driven games, so I can't think of any cheaty bosses. Like that's more of a action game platformer kind of thing. Hmm. I feel like the I, I also don't play many games that would arise would would tend to create a, a gimmicky boss battle, but uh, I I do remember fondly the boss battles from Space Chem. Oh, I never I never beat that. You never but you Wait. played Space Chem, right? You know where you like have to use the chemistry stuff to like control the the thing that's fighting the boss. Wait, I'm getting a conf fused with the alchemy game oh yeah from, um, from zachtronics yeah they are similar were there boss battles in that one i don't think there were no i don't well i don't know there were extra challenging puzzles you know every once in a while but they weren't bosses yeah in in, uh, in space chem there was like these boss levels every once in a while where you'd have you basically have to create a like a game controller out of your chemistry things that are doing chemistry stuff and so like you you'd have three buttons to do different things and then you could decide what those three buttons meant and so it was it was this weird crazy thing it wasn't really it wasn't really the boss that was cheating it was just like changing changing the rules for the boss fight interesting i can't even remember what space chem looks like hang on Okay, yes, now I remember. Yes, the, uh, is that Greek alphabet symbols? Hmm, I think Alpha so. Beta. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I remember those would be on the board. Oh, uh, yeah, I did not get very far in this game, actually. I fell oh, in man. love with the, I, one of I my fell favorites. in love with the, with the alchemy one, which I can't remember what it's called now, but Space Chem, I didn't get Opus very Magnum. far. Opus Magnum. Opus Magnum, that's it. I went to finish it, and um, I had it through Xbox Game Pass or one of those gaming services. And apparently it's like Netflix where just games come and go, so I never finished Opus Magnum. They took it off the service, so now it's on my Steam wish list, and um, I'm waiting for it to go on sale, just because I'm cheap. It's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool game. Yeah, I can't think it of any really other is. boss boss battles that were cheaty. Um, I mean, like there's bosses that I don't know. Yeah, I I don't tend to play the kind of game that would cheat in a boss battle. 
Like, I really like having just, like, a challenge with the systems that are already established. Right, and there's there is that that philosophy should a boss be this incredible puzzle that you've got is the boss a new challenge that you must puzzle your way through or is a boss a final test for all the stuff that you've already learned and Hmm. those are the two schools of thought and i'm very much favor the final test style of boss i actually think it's a huge um it gets in the way of... I play a lot of narrative-driven games, and narrative games really suffer if you die ten times fighting the final boss. <laughs> like, it doesn't feel like you won at the end. It feels like you just, you know, groundhog day your way through it. And it feels like, eh, I think the bad guy kind of won. Yeah. And it really I takes guess, okay. all the... Okay, yeah. cheaty boss, I, I thought of one. Deus Ex Human Revolution. All the bosses in that game cheated. They were all cheaters, and I hated all of them. And, uh, yeah, so there you go. Deus Ex Human Revolution, you stink. Yeah, that's the correct answer to this question. I can't believe I didn't think of that. Uh, You know what I didn't think of that? I don't even think of those as boss fights. I don't know what those are, (laughs) right? (laughs) It's just like an interjection of an entirely different game in the middle of a stealth game that you were playing just moments ago. Right. And then suddenly we're going to play Doom, but I'm Solid Snake. <laughs> like, what? Uh, oh, it was bad. All right. Um, I didn't shorten this question, but I want to do this DX9 to DX11. I'm just going to try it. I'm just going to wing it. Dear DieCast, I don't know if you're tuned in to Morpurger news, but there's a pretty exciting development happening in Guild Wars 2 this week. The game has been running in DirectX 9 since its release in 2012, but they are opening up a DirectX 11 open beta and have stated their plans to eventually transition completely. How uncommon is it to switch rendering systems on a live game like this? What kinds of wacky bugs can we expect? Are there any insights you can glean from these screenshots that a total layperson might not be able to see? Do you really think this is likely to really speed up performance in general? What really is DirectX 11 doing? Because that entire last section of the blog post is just gibberish to me. Thanks for your insights, Doug. Um, so how common is this? Well, this is incredibly rare. You have to have a game survive long enough for this to be worth it. I mean, Memorpurgers, you know, not many of them get to live this long. And even when they do... Once they live, you know, once they hit their eighth birthday, everybody's sort of just accept their ancient graphics as part of their charm. The only other game I can think of that got a radical overhaul like this is World of Warcraft. And that's, that game's the exception to every rule. Yeah. So, so this is weird. This is, we can't say it's unprecedented, but it's definitely very uncommon. It's very expensive. The game's obviously doing fine without it. And I think it's really strange that they're focusing on performance. Um, The game came out in 2012. It ran fine back then. So, like, now that... Now that... In fact, the game is now nine years old. Now that the game is nine years old, you're worried about performance? Huh? (laughs) You know... 99% 99% of your user base has upgraded their computer since then. Probably everybody's capped at 60 frames a second. Like, why would you improve the frame? What's the business case? I'm not against them doing it, but I'm just, like, really wondering, somebody sitting around going, oh, you know what would really drum up some business is a jump to DX11. Like, who's going to join this game because they update the rendering engine? This is a very expensive okay. step. How about this? A bunch of people are working from home now, but they don't have their own computers. Their employer bought them an HP Pavilion. Want to play? Gotta get a <laughs> graphics upgrade. <laughs> right. All right, well, maybe that would do it. Yeah, Uh. What? what kinds of wacky bugs can we expect? I don't know. I don't know. When you change engines like that, it's... I mean, in theory, it should just work. I mean, that's what that's what the docs will tell you. <laughs> you just... Uh-huh. You just... 
You just recompile it with the new libraries and it'll be fine and it'll just work. Air quotes. So I, I honestly don't really know. shocked. He describes it as as the upgrade will allow it to spread CPU cycles more evenly across each rendering frame, which just that shocks me because in my mind the the graphic side should not be interacting with the CPU really at all. Is that is that something that happens a lot? I wonder I is I read that and I assumed they meant GPU. It would load balance across okay. multiple GPUs. But maybe, maybe there's some CPU balancing, maybe um DX eleven has some kind of worker thread that it does for you when you send it a bunch of polygons? I don't know. Um, That'd be kind of neat. That would be, although that would seem very platform dependent in a way that kind of goes against DirectX of what it's supposed oh, to do. Oh, okay. Here's another possibility. Here's a possibility. What if they're doing this upgrade so that they can use cloud service gaming platforms and they don't support the old DirectX versions? like stadia or whatever oh yeah interesting oh but those services have to support like dx9 that would be crazy if they didn't it seems like but on the other hand maybe they're they've got like super specialized hardware that only works on certain versions of DirectX, or maybe there's new hardware that's coming out that doesn't support dx9 anymore and like they want it to be still be playable on newer versions of the the hardware. Oh, that's a scary thought. I mean, DX9 is uh served for a long time. Yeah, it's everywhere. Right. I mean, I I think it had I think it was like an entire decade at least. Like some DX versions, you know, kind of came and went quickly. I don't think 7 was allowed around for very long. I might be misremembering. This is all like going back to the 90s or the early aughts. Yeah, I, I seem to remember so, DX4 was like a bunch of games came with it and then they're like, actually, it's DX5 now. Uh, don't don't pay any yeah. attention to DX4. Right. That was a mistake. Hmm. Um, yeah, so I don't know what else to say about that. It is interesting, but it's odd that they're going... I mean, if I heard, hey, we're updating our graphics engine, I would assume, oh, you're going to DX12 and you're going to, like, enable ray tracing for people with high-end machines. That would be the move I would expect from a business standpoint. Right, yeah. Why not go to the latest version? Right, we're going to do this horrendously time-consuming and difficult you know it's it's not that bad to do it probably it's not that bad to do it on a game that's not yet released but when the game is live and you've got like a million different machines running it and they're all different configurations you're just gonna have so much support headaches man because <clears throat> like, I, I can only imagine that they're allowing you to stay on the dx9 version of the client because this is all client side right right i would assume so they're gonna upload. They're gonna update the server to use DX11. <laughs> <laughs> All their marketing screenshots can just be beautiful, amazing. All right. Well, I don't know what to think about that. That's certainly a weird development. I'm mystified that they're putting in all that work for performance on a nine-year-old game. That seems like. I mean, I'm sure there's a few people out there that are like trying to run the game on 4K monitors and like will appreciate the but that's going to be you know super small niche market if you really wanted to be if you really want to do this and you really want to like give people a reason to come back to the game after about several years yeah go to 12 and enable ray tracing and then everybody will be like oh, i want to see what the game looks like with ray tracing enabled but now sure. you're going to but now you're going to go to 11 that's weird um uh, maybe vr does 11 have vr support Oh, I'm sure it does. I'm sure it does. So maybe I'll bet nine you, doesn't. Yeah, yeah, maybe that's it. So, All right. Very strange. Uh, last one. Go ahead. Dear Diecast, I've always found it fascinating how the MCU has become a cultural touchstone without ever producing a standout or masterpiece film, just through the novelty of the shared universe concept and releasing a boatload of consistent, for the most part, movies. So. Do you actually have any favorite MCU films or, or even ones that you would love? Dragon Age. Uh, 
I, I thought I thought that was your answer, and I was like, "Is that no? Nope, that's the person who wrote it. The entire <laughs> right. series of games. Thank you, Dragon Age series. <laughs> Thank um, you. Your second franchise. version was not great. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So my two standout MCU films are Guardians of the Galaxy two and Thor Ragnarok, which I think are far above the others in terms of in terms of like being really fun to watch um a lot of the earlier movies took themselves way too seriously especially the first few thor movies like thor is inherently ridiculous right and that's fine superheroes themselves are inherently ridiculous and there's there's something to be said for taking it super seriously and doing the Zack snyder thing but like there's something to be said for just making, for just embracing what you've got. And I think Thor Ragnarok and Guardians of the Galaxy 2 both really, for one thing, they both, um, Guardians of the Galaxy 2 has a really strong emotional core. Um, mm. And um, Thor Ragnarok is just really fun and funny. And I think they're both quite strong. Although it is true that neither of them are classics in the way that, say, I don't know, you know, The Matrix is just this amazing classic movie, or Back to the Future, or Die Hard. Sure, you know, Star Wars it, Episode Two. Right, it's not one of those movies where I go to my kids and like, okay, you really need to see this to understand the culture that we live in. Um... You know, Marvel is, even though Marvel is pervasive, it's also kind of disposable. And, like, if you haven't seen it, people might look at you funny, but you won't be, like, missing any important context for cinema. As long as you know that the movies exist, you're good. Well, where there's also I, this weird thing where, like, when Back to the Future came out, you couldn't just go on Reddit and watch all the memes about it without ever seeing right. the show itself. Like when, you know, any of those older films came out, you had to be in the theater to get the whole experience. And it was very difficult to share that experience with other people or your thoughts about it without having actually seen it. So I think that maybe the internet culture has changed the way that we even think about standout masterpiece films anymore. Like maybe it's not possible to have one because it's so much easier to communicate about them. It's true. It's it's true that you get the feeling if you don't see one of these big blockbusters you get the familiarity breeds contempt feeling from them just because hey i didn't see this movie but oh my gosh for two weeks reddit was insufferable with jokes i didn't get and screen grabs that made no sense to me doing quotes i've never heard of some dumb thing that means nothing to me and so you're almost like just sick of the movie even though you've never seen it i've i've actually f experienced that myself where you know sometimes it makes you want to like oh i want to join the conversation and know what the conversation's about and sometimes you're like i am so sick of hearing about this movie already <laughs> and it just came out and i have no plans to see it <laughs> yeah that's true it is very different it was very different of course movies used to play a lot longer back in the day too I mean, some of the E.T. was in theaters for years. Mm, yeah. For years, you drive by a small theater and they're like, whoa, they've still got E.T. Crazy. And people would just see that movie again and again and again. Um, that doesn't happen anymore. They're like, okay, it's, it's, it's done its two months in the theater. Now we just take it away from the world so nobody can see it at all for three months. And now... You, and then and then we'll sell it on DVD. Sure. And then once or we get on a streaming service, or right. you know, you're going to be able to watch it on airplanes all the time, or whatever. Right. Well, the the old progression was it's in the theater, and then there'd be a wait, and then maybe a second run in the theater, and then a wait, and then there'd be the the edited down for TV with commercials version, which was just like, ugh, you know, but. You know, that was a secondary market. And then somewhere in that yeah. thing, they added home video. And th there would be home video rentals. And then after everybody rented it, they'd be like, okay, and now we'll sell you all these old rental tapes that we, nobody wants. And uh -huh. you can buy them. Uh -huh. 
and it forms this giant food chain of really i mean i think it's it's a pretty smart way of doing it the people who really want to see it pay 20 bucks and see it in the theater once and the people that are kind of interested will you know rent it for five bucks and then the people that are you know, or the you know the people who want who really like it will pay 20 bucks and see it multiple times at home and then there'll be the people that'll pay five bucks to rent it and then there'll be the people who will watch it for free on streaming just just because it's available oh yeah there's that one movie i skipped a couple years ago i guess i'll watch that it's on at nine right and it it works its way down so that you get the people that are willing to pay a lot for it pay a lot and the people that are only it's only worth a couple bucks to them pay a couple bucks and i think that's a good way for it to like wind its way through the culture it's a pretty good system um yeah that's what i think of the mcu though those two movies i think are the standouts i also here's a curious curious thing about the mcu maybe people will find this interesting the one mcu i've watched movie i've watched more than any of the others is avengers age of ultron and oh really the critical consensus is it's the weakest of all the avengers movies it's one of the weakest movies in the mcu it's one of those ones that everybody's sort of like uh it didn't really work and i can't really gainsay any of them there's a lot wrong with the movie but I don't know why I keep re-watching it. There's something I really like in that movie. And I think maybe it's just James Spader as Ultron. Um, and everybody says, hmm. you know, Ultron's really boring. And I can't argue, I can't like tell you why I find him interesting. Other than James Spader just chewing on the scenery for 90 minutes. I don't know. Why do I keep watching that movie? You are fascinated with artificial intelligence. Right. But why does Ultron have lips? It bugs me so much. <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. He's a robot. He has moving lips. They're obviously not part of his articulation of English because it comes from some sort of synthesizer. So why are the lips there? And why did Jaws Whedon put them in the movie? It makes no sense. I don't understand. Anyway, thank you so much for your question, Dragon Age. Uh, if you have a question for the show, you can email us. Our email is diecast at shamusyoung.com, and we will be happy to answer your questions. So, yeah, thank you for everybody who sent us in questions. Thank you for all the well wishes, and we'll see you next week. Say goodbye, Paul. Go play some video games, everybody. And if you want to see why robots have lips, go read the entire 20-year back catalog of Schlock Mercenary.